Montreal. It was, it was in the wintertime. My friend says, John, we're going skiing. Now, I don't ski. Nobody's ever looked at me and went, you ski, don't you? No. Now, I wouldn't ski, but I'll go and look at the mountains and everything. But no, they gave me tequila. Now, apparently, after the fifth shot of tequila, you think you can ski. They should have a warning on the label. A chubby guy skiing with a slash through it. After the tenth shot, I thought I was peekaboo panette. And I didn't have a ski suit. Surprise, surprise. But they bought me one. It was white. That's my color. Good morning. It's Thursday, Delta Force Thursday, September the 14th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have Stuart Varney, my take, rules for retrogrades, no free lunch, the rape of the mind, Bishop Barron, and we will have... You Decide Between the View and the Five, and Inside Delta Force. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Now there's no free lunch. 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Free Trade Trade protection accumulates upon a single point the good which it affects while the evil inflicted is infused throughout the mass. The one strikes the eye at a first glance while the other becomes perceptible only to close investigation. Friedrich Bastiat Herein lies the rub on protectionism. The singular benefit to the single actor it creates is easily identifiable, but the broad and lasting damage it does to a host of actors requires further inquiry. This in no way makes the damage protectionism does any less potent. 
And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, The Rape of the Mind. Part 3. Unobtrusive Coercion. In the course of our investigations concerning thought control, menticide, and brainwashing, it has become clearer that more attention must be given to the means by which inner preparedness for mental submission is brought about. Unobtrusively, personal development and various cultural influences can make man more vulnerable to suggestion an ideological attack. In part three, I call to the reader's attention the creeping intrusion into our minds by technology and bureaucracy and how special forms of prejudice and mass delusion can take possession of our minds before we are aware of it. The final chapter, An Inquiry on Treason and Loyalty, again calls to our attention the tremendous influence of mass thinking on our personal concepts of loyalty. And that was Unobtrusive Coercion from The Rape of the Mind by Juice Mirlo, M.D. Thank you, thank you. And now, from uh, Ayn Rand, The Anatomy of Compromise, quote, The three rules listed below are by no means exhaustive. They are merely the first leads to the understanding of a vast subject. One, in any conflict between two men or two groups who hold the same basic principles, it is the more consistent one who wins. Number two, in any collaboration between two men or two groups who hold different basic principles, it is the more evil or irrational one who wins. Number three, when opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. When they are not clearly defined, but are hidden or evaded, it works to the advantage of the irrational side. Unquote. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Rule 16 from Rules for Retrogrades, 40 Tactics to Defeat the Radical Left. Rule 16, never utter, think, or imply that the retrograde merely upholds the status quo. He does not. As every American should know, the retrograde is and must be capable of revolutionary action, whenever civil society and the common good depend upon it. History abounds with the colorful narrative of the righteous actions of such audacious retrogrades. Once per year, the celebration of the Declaration of Independence reminds us of a handful of such examples. Think of heroes such as Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams. Conversely, radicals have portrayed and gullible right centrists have bought the notion that a conservative must, by virtue of being one who conserves, always oppose decisive political action. This is a dangerous fallacy. Many have fallen for it. Yet, like Nietzsche wrote of the essence of music, the retrograde spirit must be half revolutionary, Dionysian, and half establishmentarian, Apollonian. The first part invokes that whenever despotism shows its ugly face, dauntless men sever ties with tyrannical old regimes. The second part requires that those same bold men, retrogrades to be sure, construct a just, stable, lasting regime upon the same principles over which the prior regime was abrogated. In fact, the concept of a well-made republic requires it to perdure It must be capable of stasis, Apollonian, in its foundational principles of justice and liberty, while able to undergo small adjustments, Dionysian, in times of need. If the Republic's foundational principles are deemed so broken as to be necessarily cast aside, then the need for a full-on change of regime will present itself. Imagine the debility 
when a republic operates on the faulty assumption that, categorically speaking, its people ought to be impotent to all occasions of necessary counteraction. No doubt the radicals have been instrumental in popularizing this spurious anti-republican worldview. In other words, the Dionysian component of republicanism sustains the critical, chaotic, energetic spirit of the retrograde, which activates whenever conditions have grown decadent, complacent, immoral, or tyrannical. On the other hand, the Apollonian component maintains, as long as possible, the ordered, traditional, stable spirit of republicanism operating within the abiding norms of law and culture for as long as they can truly be said to survive. The retrograde credo does not involve the latter only, but both together. As long as a republic stays true to its righteous foundational principles, stasis remains the watchword. When it strays from such principles, daring men must work drastic change through either revision or revolution. Here's how it all plays out in real terms. Each year in America, the 4th of July presents a ripe opportunity for meaningful explication of the principle of retrograde dualism, Dionysus and Apollo together. Moderate conservatives who began giving purchase to the don't rock the boat principle cannot even begin to account for salutary revolutions like that of 1776. The signing of the Declaration of Independence must be quite the enigma to such tepid celebrants of the holiday. At present, they cannot make heads or tails of it, yet they must be informed. The retrograde himself must tell the guests at his July 4th barbecue what bad citizens they are in their passivity. He must chasten them that they cut a perfect image of Jefferson's, quote, timid men who prefer the calm of despotism to the tempestuous seas of liberty, unquote. That is, they cannot make necessary remedial changes based upon natural law to the republic as it groans under the tip of the savage spear of anti-Christian culture and beneath the weight of the despotic regime. At the 4th of July, we Americans celebrate a right of rebellion in hearing in God's nature. This right of self-defense requires retrogrades to be fully conscious of the Dionysian component of their own credo. And that was uh, Rule 16 for, um, uh, from Rules for Retrogrades, 40 Tactics to Defeat the Radical Left by Timothy and David Gordon. Now, um, he had said here, oh, you should never support the status quo. Basically, that's, that's what he said. And then he goes on to basically contradict himself. L let's be clear about this. Being a conservative means that you make the presumption for the status quo. That's all. You make the presumption. We start all arguments, all fights, all whatever. In, if we're in politics and we're in the House of uh, – in Congress – and we're going to have a debate about something. The, the debate we start with is what's wrong with the status quo. And if somebody can provide a reason, a good, solid reason for change, then we go ahead and consider change. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that you hang on to the status quo like grim death. That's, um, that's not conservative. That is um, instead reactionary. So the reactionaries are the people that resist change at all costs. They fight it and fight it and fight it and fight it on principle. Change is bad. Uh, it's always unnecessary. It's, it always results in something bad. So therefore, we're going, going to resist it. Conservatives say no. We make the presumption for the status quo, but if you can give us a good reason for change, a prima facie case for change, we will change. Slavery was a prima facie case for change. Now, one of the examples that he uses is the Revolutionary War, which makes my point for me. The, the colonists didn't just go willy-nilly uh, as soon as they got here and say, uh, screw you, Britain, we're going uh, to go out on our own. No. The colonists said to the king, uh, we, want, we are your loyal subjects. We wish to remain loyal subjects. Okay? We, we make the presumption for the status quo. But... You are making it difficult. 
if not impossible, for us to remain loyal subjects because of the following. And they have a whole list in the Declaration of Independence, a list of grievances. The king doesn't do this, he does that, he does the other thing, you quarter troops, you uh, don't uh, give uh, trials, uh, proper trials, you don't, uh, there's, no t- there's taxation without representation, on and on and on and on. Okay, so basically what they said was, fix these problems so that we can remain your loyal subjects. The king and his parliament uh, basically ignored the colonists and in so doing created the prima facie case for change. The colonists basically told, look, we gave you a shot to, to uh, uh, correct the mistakes so that we can be, remain your loyal subjects. Since you refused to do so, we have no other choice. Because they say in the Declaration of Independence that revolution, revolutionary change is the last resort. Okay, And so that's, what, that, that's the way they did it. They gave the king the chance to correct his mistakes, but since he refused to do it, the colonists said, we have no other choice. We've got to go our own way. And that's exactly what they did. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. We have a tendency, we sinners, to read our religious lives in this self-interested way. If I go to Mass, and if I pray sufficiently, and I follow God's moral law, then God will give me good things. Well, I don't know how anyone can read a page of the Bible and think that makes sense. Show me where the Bible gives us that assurance that if I just follow all the divine laws properly, then I will receive worldly benefits and comfort. I mean, it's almost like contrary. How is God acting? God is always acting in such a way that the grace he gives us is meant to be given away. Yes, the Lord gives us grace. He reveals things to us. He draws us into his life. He invites us into the liturgy. He invites us into moral excellence. Yes, indeed. And all that's a great But what's it meant to do? It's meant finally to flow through us to become a grace for others. And that was Bishop Robert Barron back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Stuart Varney's My Take. Ah, the census department just took down Bidenomics. But economists may rant, politicians may spin, but the hard numbers do not lie. Bidenomics is making us poorer. Inflation is the cause, and inflation is the result of, yeah, money printing by the Fed, and yes, the massive spending, which is Bidenomics. Not to mention the ending of our energy independence. Got that too. In 2022, the inflation-adjusted income for men <coughs> dropped $3,620. That's for men. For women, it dropped $2,880. Every income group lost ground. The poor, of course, lost more than the wealthy. That's always the case when inflation hits. Look at middle America. And here, let's single out the upwardly mobile strivers who make $94,000 to $153,000 a year. That group lost $4,600 in 2022. If elections are fought and lost on the economy, the Biden-Harris ticket is not looking good, especially when Republicans will endlessly bring up Trump's stellar economy. So now what? Bidenomics part two, that is the Green New Deal. More spending, gigantic deficits, massive subsidies, and possibly a rebound for inflation. It's not a pretty picture, but then again, Bidenomics never was. Second hour of Varney just getting started. So, um... I, he was, again, real slow news day for uh, the bloody tourist Stuart Varney because uh, I don't need him and his statistics to tell me that there is inflation. I find that out every time I go and put gas in the car or every time I go to the grocery store. Come on, Stuart. You're going to be greedy. You're going to have to do better than this. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, a little bit of uh, Stuart Varney. As you know, Ben, uh, Biden's age is a growing topic even among the liberal media. Uh, Ben, just watch this, please. Roll it. Everybody we talk to, every political discussion, all uh, it, it talks a lot about Trump, but when it comes to Joe Biden, people say, 
man, he's too old to run, isn't he? I mean, he's not going to he's not really going to run. Democrats off the air will say Joe Biden's too old. Why is he running on the air? They won't say that. Ben, the White House has to be listening to listening to this. I think they're rattled. Well, I, I think that the David Ignatius column that ran in the Washington Post really was the permission slip for a lot of people, especially those who are in the more centrist part of the Democratic Party. Just- so um, centrist part, there's no centrist anything. Uh, there's the radicals in the um, Democrat Party and the people that support them. That the, You could say the, the radicals are the people that have guts. They're the ones that are willing to... Um, say what they uh, want and need to say, and everybody else is too scared to, to uh, argue against them. So uh, that for the beginning. Also, this must be a slow news day because anytime they're talking about uh, Stuart Varney, the what, what I is a guy I refer to as the bloody tourist. Uh, whenever he's talking about Joe Biden and Joe Biden's age, it must be a slow news day. And it's been a slow news week. Uh, for that matter. And so then uh, Joe Biden seems to be the go-to guy on uh, Fox. Uh, CNN and MSNBC have uh, Donald Trump. They don't know what else to talk about. They talk about Donald Trump. So does uh, the bloody tourist Stuart Varney because he's greedy. And Joe Biden is money. Remember that. Uh, these people are in this and they're they're not in it. They pretend. They do just enough to make you think that they're in this because they're patriots. No, they're in this because they're greedy. Don't forget it. Back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. So today on You Decide is going to be between The View and The Five. And uh, The View is going to be talking about the Republicans' impeachment of, um, uh, or, or pending impeachment of Joe Biden. And The Five is going to be talking about Hunter Biden and his indictment today. So we'll first start off with The Five. Joe Biden's problems just got worse. His son Hunter getting indicted on three gun charges It's relying on a federal form three years ago while cracked out of his mind. And it's the same firearm that got tossed out in a garbage can, which he then blamed on illegals. If convicted, Hunter could face up to 25 years in the slammer. And prosecutors hint there could be more charges on the way. It's a real head scratcher if you take Joe's word that his son has done nothing wrong. First of all, my son's done nothing wrong. I trust him. I have faith in him. And it impacts my presidency by making me feel proud of him. This thing about a gun, I didn't know anything about it. I've got confidence in my son. I love him. And uh, he's on a straight and narrow, and he has been for a couple of years now. And I'm just so proud of him. Mm, Democrats are relieved that Hunter's gun charges don't have anything to do with Joe Biden yet. We shouldn't take delight in other people's misfortunes, but we have to have a rule of law. And when people... Uh, commit crimes, then the consequences follow. The Justice Department charges have nothing to do with the president. Hunter Biden is a private citizen. He is not the president of the United States. It sounds like a prosecutor appointed by Donald Trump, kept by Joe Biden to investigate his own son, has found that there's no wrongdoing that Joe Biden did. So, um, great. Tell that to Fang Fang. Joe Biden's other problem that's not named Hunter is his age. And it looks like Democrats can't avoid that one either. Well, age is a relative thing, as we all know. Let's be in the very positive vein about age. It is about judgment, and that's what a president needs to have. Joe Biden knows his why. The conclusion that people draw is, I think, off base. When people say to me, well, he's old, yeah, that's right, but look at what he's gotten done. And then, if that's not enough for you, look at the alternative. The White House gets frustrated with the media for bringing it up, but they're not going to stop. It's a water cooler issue with the public. It just is. All right, Judge, gun charges. Is this all there is, or is there more to come? 
there is definitely more to come. First of all, uh, the walls are closing in on Joe Biden right now. The dominoes have started to fall. We talked about this with David Ignatius, the, the opinion piece in the Washington, the opinion piece in the Washington Post. We knew that it was going to start falling apart. And then we have Nancy Pelosi, you know, who's a very smart woman who is able to say very clearly that, you know, Joe Biden is the greatest, Kamala is the greatest. And instead, she refuses to say that Kamala Harris is the best running mate for Joe Biden. Okay. And then you've got Mika Brzezinski actually saying this morning that this has now become a real serious discussion about Joe's age and his, his mental acuity. Okay. But now we've got the First time in American history that a president's son has been indicted. He's been indicted for something that is very much a provable crime. It is a matter of record, the public record. Uh, he has made admissions in the book, three counts to this indictment, uh, adding up to 25 years. However, those 25 years, if he were to be convicted of all three, lying on the form, lying to the person he bought the gun from, and actually possessing the gun while uh, he was under um, the, the influence of, of drugs... Uh, the sentence would be the sentences would be run concurrently. That means he's never going to get 25 years. And as a first offender, it's probably not going to be anything, you know, even near the highest charge or the lowest, which is five years. However, what is stunning about all this is that there was absolutely nothing preventing this indictment from being uh, issued five years ago or four years and 11 months ago. The fact that David Weiss now has special prosecutor status hasn't given him him any additional powers that he didn't already have mm -hmm. because this indictment is in Delaware where Hunter lives where the crime was committed and David Weiss has always had the power in that particular place now the whistleblowers are the ones who really open this thing up to us because Joe Biden has been lying and you, and you actually do get it it's his son he loves him my son has done nothing wrong we pretty much expect every parent to say that kind of thing but this is not the end of it by any by you know any stretch of the imagination this is one count that is just a door opener and what will come now given the kind of you see what's happening with the press now what we've got are even democrats like nancy pelosi kind of saying eh, you know who knows mika brzezinski man there's a real serious discussion the the the, the, the flood waters are coming in the next will be on the tax indictment OK, you cannot do an indictment of the taxes and Hunter Biden without investigating Joe. And as they investigate Joe, more information is going to come out about as they investigate Hunter, more will come out about Joe. Now, Weiss saying that it was not his decision, whistleblowers coming forward. We've got everything now in a situation where this thing is all, all, you know, damn the torpedoes, the Bidens are going down. We talked about this yesterday. It's just a question of when. All right, Dana. Now on to Joe. The cat is no longer in the on the roof. Where's he now? It's in a he's it's in a shoebox, getting ready for burial in the backyard. Oh, already. He's and I think we're seeing the bat signal. We're seeing the bat signal go out to everybody. It's okay to talk about it. Yeah, they've had that terrible, no good, very bad week. Yeah. This week. And it started, I think, in, on Sunday in Vietnam when the president gave the press conference mm -hmm. that was incoherent. Monday, he got slammed for being in Alaska on 9-11. Tuesday, the David Ignatius column post, which basically gives the green light to the establishment to open the floodgates. And now you have on Thursday the inflation report and a Hunter indictment. I'd say that's a pretty bad week. Yeah. And then, so my question is, um, I'm interested in the legal front as to what's next, but also for me politically, what's next? So now you have Joe Biden, who will probably go to the beach this weekend, right? And Or somewhere, maybe Camp David. He'll be with his family. And does he start to make the decision? Does anybody start to talk to him mm -hmm. about what we are actually seeing? I don't know. Maybe he doesn't want to hear it. Maybe no one in his circle is able to tell him directly. Maybe that's why these messages are coming from outside. And someone could say, sir, we really need to have a serious conversation. And does it open up a position where Joe Biden would say, I've accomplished so much. Look at all I've done. I've done what I said I would do. My son is being hunted by the Republicans and it's unfair. And he's in recovery and I love him and I'm going to pardon him. And I'm going to step down from running for re-election. Mm -hmm. That is a real possibility and something that would be amazing to cover. It also could be completely untrue. Yeah. I once went to Camp David, but he was busy doing a drag show. <laughs> so... <laughs>
no one gets that. I got it. Jesse, I'm pretty sure you could see Gavin Newsom's grinning teeth from the International Space Station. <laughs> Because of the whitening? Yeah. No, because Biden, he might not jump. I'll tell you why. I don't know if he wants to leapfrog a black female VP. Mm -hmm. He might keep his powder dry until 2028. Remember, if Trump wins, it's only one term. And let's be honest, if Trump wins the revenge tour, it's going to be tough for a Republican to win (laughs) after that. So Gavin could just keep his powder dry and wait. Um, So I'm not sure he's jumping in. And... I'm also not sure Biden's going down. He's definitely heading down, but he's not going down without a fight. Mm -hmm. This is Joe Biden we're talking about, the stubbornest man in Washington, Mm -hmm. D.C. It's going to get ugly. So Weiss is his pocket boy. He's still protecting Hunter. I don't think he's going to serve a day in jail on the guns. I think they're just going to drag it out. It's a charge not connected to the president. And... They don't often prosecute this because it's really hard to prove because most people don't confess to being on drugs and buying guns. Mm -hmm. Only Hunter is dumb enough to pull that off. So you're right, though. Now everyone says it's okay to talk about Joe Biden, but they don't know what to say. Because in the Democratic Party, you have to say the same thing as everybody else. If you don't say the same thing as everybody else, you're ostracized. Mm -hmm. So everyone's kind of feeling around in the dark. Uh, Is it okay if we talk badly about Kamala? Is it all right if we mention Joe Biden's age? And it's fun to watch because usually they're so militantly disciplined in their messaging. This is they're spazzing and it's very entertaining. Um, the bank records are where it's going to be. They're going to go after Hunter's and Joe's, but the offshore is where the action is. Mm-hmm. You can move money from an offshore account to an offshore account. IRS has no clue. Comer's not going to know. Not even the IRS whistleblowers are going to find it. So you got to find the offshore. Oh, I wish I knew that earlier. Yeah. Right. Oh. <laughs> Tulsi, I think the real fear is not that Joe is incapacitated. They don't care as long as he wins. They don't care if he's, you know, a vegetable. They fear he's going to lose, especially with impeachment looming. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is even bigger than Joe Biden, that it, that this is why we're seeing what we're seeing is they're saying, well, this guy could actually really lose, which means the Democrat elite, the power elite, they lose. Mm-hmm. And so this is why you're starting to see a little bit of this transition here. With, will it be Kamala Harris? Will it be somebody else? Uh, but one thing that I thought was interesting is, you know, people are talking about Biden's accomplishments. And in that Ignatius piece, He said, Biden's accomplished so much. He's done all these things. His greatest accomplishment was that he beat Donald Trump. Right. That was was like a few years ago. Yeah. And then you have Hillary saying, you know, we'll just look at what Joe Biden's gotten done. Well, when we actually look at what he's gotten done, the reality is our country is worse off now than when Joe Biden took office. And there's a whole laundry list of things that we can get into. Uh, I've wrote down about 10 of them. Um, (laughs) Uh, without even scratching the surface. But but most seriously, he's gotten us into a new Cold War and a hot proxy war with Russia that has increased the likelihood of nuclear catastrophe. We just saw how he has pushed Russia and North Korea directly into each other's arms, Mm -hmm. increasing the threat coming from North Korea directly to the American people and our national security. Uh, Our borders have been handed over to the cartels. Our cities have been handed over to the criminals. Parents' rights are being threatened uh, with regard to their child's education. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, it's not a hard argument to make to voters about why a Joe Biden presidency or, frankly, any of the Democrats they could pick to replace him could end up pushing our country to a place that is uh, dangerously beyond repair. In there, you made that great point, is that President Biden's greatest accomplishment as president was being president. Yeah. There's nothing else. Well, just, just walking in the door. Stuart's walking in the door. That's amazing. Like, he's a And that was uh, The Five, Fox, from Fox News, uh, talking about uh, the Hunter Biden indictment on gun charges. And uh, next up is going to be The View talking about the um, yesterday's opening of a, the McCarthy opening a, an impeachment inquiry against President Biden yesterday. Something has happened that the, the Republicans have been hoping for and praying for that they've been just everything they could think of. Huh. And, and they finally have found a way and they announced it. They are going to go forward with trying to impeach the president of the United States right now, Joe Biden. And I say, listen, 
<laughs> you had seven years to go after Bo. We see how well that went. So go ahead. I think you, you, uh, Hunter. Uh, Hunter. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, Hunter Biden. That's that's seven years you went after him. So you you've been saying you go and do whatever you have to do, and when you get all the stuff you think you got, come to us and let us know. I want to see. See, because we took our time and made sure we had our stuff ducks in a row. So I want to see the same thing. But Matt Gates, you know, he, he, he was. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's the worst. Not a big fan of Matt Gates. Sorry. <laughs> you know, he was uh, sending wolf tickets out, and I'll, we'll show you the clip. Moments ago, Speaker McCarthy endorsed an impeachment inquiry. Mr. Speaker, dust off our written January agreement. You have a copy. Reflect on the spirit of that agreement and build on the start that we had moments ago. Begin to comply. No continuing resolutions, individual spending bills or bust, votes on balanced budgets and term limits, subpoenas for Hunter Biden and the members of the Biden family who've been grifting off of this country and the impeachment for Joe Biden that he so richly deserves. Do these things or face a motion. To vacate the chair. Oh, he's getting, he's threatening. He's threatening him. Yes. He's threatening. Yes. Is there anything more pathetic than this Kevin McCarthy who is beholden to the dumbest wing in his party? Yeah. Well, yeah. In, I mean, can well, you imagine anybody in Congress speaking to Nancy Pelosi like that? She would smack him down in two pathetic. seconds. <laughs> is watching him try to be taken seriously and keep a straight face when you look at who he defends over indict an indicted former president who is literally being convicted of crimes, being held liable for sexual all of these and things. And now impeached. Yeah, and now this uh, the president who, by the way, what I think of as scandalous has changed so much in the last six years. <laughs> yeah. So I love that like I'm not trying to what about it, but now you're worked up and passionate about this yeah. and about spending yeah. cuts while you're gonna waste time doing another hearing. Like this is such BS They're I can't pathetic. even take well, and They're here's pathetic. the thing. Kevin McCarthy has two jobs that are running in direct conflict with each other. To keep his speakership and to keep the House majority, the very slim House majority. Eight, uh, 18 House Republicans won in districts that Joe Biden won. Wow. Launching an impeachment inquiry and forcing them to vote on that is going to make it extremely hard for Republicans to keep the House. Now, I'll say this, and some of you aren't going to like this. I think there's impropriety related to Biden's involvement with Hunter. I think there's been some misrepresentations. He said Hunter didn't make money from China. He said he had never met with any of his Ukrainian business partners with he had, um, which he had. He bringing him to the state dinner, I think, was bad optics. I have yet to see, and this is me, Alyssa Fair, something that's evidence of a crime. The bar is high crimes and misdemeanors right. for impeachment. And let me just tell you, I know Congress very well. This is dead on arrival in the Senate. Yeah, there are not the votes. 65 votes to convict Joe Biden. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, just, and I think people just are going to be theater. People are going to be shocked. I, I completely agree with that. I think that there is, has been there some more. <laughs> Shocking, right? More, though. Uh, I, I, I think that there has been some impropriety. I think that there are instances where Hunter Biden, in, a, in an attempt to show access to the vice presidency, the vice president's office made phone calls to daddy. Those have been taped. I think we have the situation uh, with uh, his work in, in Ukraine. We have the situation with his work in China. There's no way that political influence wasn't a part of that. I don't like nepotism across the board. I mean, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so I understand that there is some real concern there. But what is upsetting to me is that Kevin McCarthy and the Republican, this right-wing Republican party is trivializing what impeachment is. Yeah. High yeah. crimes and misdemeanors. Our former twice impeached, disgraced former president accused of, accused of um, you know, Talking to President Zelensky of, of Ukraine and trying to do a quid pro quo and trade information for arms when his country was about to start a, go into can, war with Russia. That's Don't you think that's pretty on? significant? It is, but yeah, just but. one thing, because I do think there's something that is sending shockwaves through the Biden West ring right now this morning, and it is not this impeachment inquiry. Hmm. It is David Ignatius, a Biden friend and at the Washington Post who came out and wrote a piece saying Joe Biden and Kamala Harris should not run again. And his reason for saying it, and I know, I know how the table feels about this, is Joe Biden's crowning achievement, his most significant, was defeating Donald Trump, Trump yeah. and we are yeah. not sure that he can beat Donald Trump in 2024. Listen, the only way any of this will make sense is prove it. 
prove your stuff. This, yeah. You know, risk. If there is impropriety, this is what we this is what we asked them to do with Bonehead. Mm-hmm. We said, have with who? prove it. But my but my point is, if there's improprieties, do do the legal thing. Right. Yeah. Take it to take it to court. Make it show us what it is. It's not enough to say, well, so and so said this is what it is. No, they wanted to find out what did the last guy do. Here's all the stuff he did. Yeah. But this if is, there is stuff that you're saying, not you, but if, if there are things that people are saying that the White House did that are illegal, then shut them prove but it. But, Bobby, this is what Steve Bannon calls flooding the zone. Just throw it out there to yeah. confuse everybody. Well, but that's what they always do. Yeah. That's but what they, they always do. The people do. of this country need to know that the Republicans are on the same page as Vladimir Putin, who said everything that is happening with Trump is the persecution of a political rival for political reasons. That is exactly what the Republican, the MAGA wing, of course, of the Republican Party is saying they are in, this, in, in sync with Vladimir Putin, who is the most evil person in the world right now. Well, yeah. some people, saying, you know, feel like there's a... And that was uh, the view on the um, inquiry into the impeachment of President Joe Biden. And now... You decide. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the final part of In the Beginning from Inside Delta Force. I hobbled in on terribly stiff, sore legs and painful feet, fell on a cot, and went immediately back to sleep. The sun was up many hours before I was. Before breakfast, we were herded outside in front of the trucks, where Sergeant Major Shoemate took the after picture, as he had promised. There were 18 men in the photograph, 18 out of the original 163 who had started. But the selection course still wasn't over. The commander's board was still to come. Our little band of walking wounded spent the rest of the morning limping around camp, cleaning and turning in our equipment. In the afternoon, we sat down in the classroom and filled out a peer report questionnaire. Since we didn't all know one another's names, we were identified by the numbered chair we sat in. The questions were all subjective in nature. Who do you think showed the most character? Who seemed the most competent? Who was the weakest? Who would you most want by your side in combat? Who would you least want by your side in combat? Who do you most trust? Who do you least trust? If you had to reject one man from this group, who would it be and why? After completing the peer report, we were free for the remainder of the afternoon. I was physically spent and achingly sore in every part of my body. But as I reflected on what I had undergone, I felt a calm sense of satisfaction and contentment. I had not just survived an ordeal, because survival, in a sense, is just passive. No, I had conquered. But conquered what? I had to think about that a while, and then I realized. Myself. I had undertaken a tremendously difficult challenge. Many men had tried and failed. Only a few of us had stayed the course. And I don't think a single man among us felt he did not merit the success he had earned. I was certainly sure I deserved to be here. It had been difficult, but I had done it solely on my own abilities. I was just glad this part was over. But the commander's board was still ahead. That, and an interview with the unit psychologist. After supper that night, we found a schedule posted on the bulletin board listing the times of our meeting with the shrink. We had already been reminded that this was still an individual effort and we were still forbidden to speak with any other candidate about the interview process. I was the first one to report to the psychologist the following morning. I found him ensconced in an easy chair tucked deep in a shadowed corner of the room. He didn't look up from the folder of papers he was studying, but with a languid wave of a white hand indicated that I take a seat on the steel chair in the center of the otherwise empty room. I had expected a less austere setting, and found my hackles starting to rise unexpectedly. 
The only thing missing is a blinding white light shining in my eyes. I sat down and waited. The psychologist casually flipped back and forth through the papers in his lap and continued to ignore my presence. If his intent was to piss me off, it was working. As I searched out the man in his darkened corner, I saw that he was a pudgy, effeminate-looking person with the longish hair of an academic. Behind his glasses, his eyes appeared weak, as though they seldom saw the sun. A smug, superior air seemed to surround the man, and when he finally spoke to me, it was off to one side, as though I was not worthy of his full attention. With no preliminaries and no mutual introductions, he launched straight into his program. Haney, he began in a sibilant voice, I'm going to outline a hypothetical situation, and I want you to tell me how you would accomplish the tasking you are given. His tone made it clear he considered it a distasteful duty to speak to me. Your commander has selected you to take out a terrorist who has been located in San Francisco. Due to the need for secrecy and the delicacy of the task, neither the local authorities nor the FBI can be made aware of the mission. You must eliminate the terrorist and then make your way undetected out of the city and back to Fort Bragg. You can leave no trace of evidence that would lead back to this unit. Tell me how you would accomplish this task. The unmoving shadow in the corner fell silent. A simple tactical exercise. Not exactly what I had expected in this interview, but oh well, let me see how I would do this. I thought about the situation for a few minutes, and then following the format of an operations order, I outlined how I would go about accomplishing the mission. The shrink remained motionless while I talked, looking only at the papers he held on his lap. When I finished speaking, he maintained his silence for at least a full minute, still studying the papers that fascinated him so. Then, at last, he lifted his eyes to me for the first time and hissed at me from the shadows. You ignorant redneck. Have you never heard of the Posse Comitatus Act? Don't you know it's against federal law for the military to be used for operations within the United States? Venom fairly dripped from his tongue. And the mission wasn't to kill a terrorist at all, but to assassinate your commander's wife's lover. The reason he selected you for this mission was he knew you were such an unthinking simpleton and a mental non-entity that you would do what he wanted without question. He paused a second before continuing. You stupid cracker. It's a good thing we have an army so white trash like you can have a place to go rather than to the local chain gang where you would doubtless be otherwise. He watched me from behind hooded eyes before concluding with, What do you have to say for yourself now? Had I been my normal self, I could have laughed it all off and asked the man to try again. But in my still near exhausted state, and without the full power of my faculties, his words hit me like a physical blow. No, that's not true. If it had been a physical assault, I would have known how to fight back. As it was, I was stunned and reeling. How dare that fat bastard speak to me that way? I felt belittled and at a complete loss as to what to do or say. As I stared at my nemesis in anger, I soon realized it had been a setup, but I was enraged and embarrassed just the same. It was one thing to be made to look stupid, but he had denigrated my background, and that was an assault on my honor. It was completely infuriating, and I was consumed with rage. The only thing saving the man from a severe beating was the fact that he was an officer. It was obvious to me now that the interview had one purpose, to mount a full-scale psychological assault and hit me where it would hurt. It had been masterfully executed. The man's objective had been to shake my self-confidence and see what kind of noises I would make under duress. This is just like a prisoner of war interrogation, I thought, and I knew that whatever I said would be wrong. I uttered one expletive and refused to talk any more. Every few minutes the guy would sneer a comment in my direction, but I had said all I was going to say, and I wasn't going to be deceived again. For the next ten minutes I sat in my chair and stared at my interrogator while the angry sound of my racing pulse pounded relentlessly in my ears. 
Eventually, he too must have realized this wasn't going any further, and that he had all he was going to get from me. He waved the pudgy white fingers of one hand in my general direction, and shifting his gaze back to his papers once again, twittered, We're finished here. Why don't you go away? With pleasure. I felt beat up, violated, and helpless to do anything about it. By the time all of us had undergone our interview with this man, I found out I wasn't alone in my reaction. In fact, he had managed to so completely destroy the sense of trust necessary for his position that none of us would ever speak to him again. He was rendered ineffective as a unit psychologist and soon left the army to pursue other opportunities. Subsequent unit psychologists were aghast that we had been subjected to such stupid treatment. All the interviews were finished by late that evening, and since a new class of candidates would be arriving the next day to start selection, we were sent back to main post at Fort Bragg to await our appearance before the commander's board. In the meantime, we would be staying at Moon Hall, where we had originally signed in. Moon Hall is a military hotel complex, and by any standards, it's quite a facility. There's also a great NCO club annex in one of the buildings, and a mess hall that would knock your socks off. Every Friday, the mess was open all afternoon. From lunch through supper, continuously offering up a succession of steamship rounds for sacrifice. Breakfast every day was a thing of beauty, and brunch on Saturdays and Sundays was out of this world. The only thing missing was a fountain of Bloody Marys. The mess sergeant, or dining facility manager, as they were called in official army newspeak, was a national award-winning chef who was hired for an astronomical salary by a New York hotel when he retired. And considering the acclaim of everyone who ever ate in his mess, he deserved every cent of that salary. We loafed around Fort Bragg for several days. The commander's board would not convene for a while, and until then, we were to relax and recuperate. We had an informal formation in the lobby every morning at ten hundred hours, and then were released to our own control. I was glad for the downtime. It turned out that I had gotten a march fracture in my left foot during the forty-miler. I thought I knew when it happened, but by that point in the march, my feet were so numb the pain couldn't register. After a few days' rest, I felt fine. Doc Smiley met us in the lobby one morning and told us the board would convene the next day. We were to report in fatigue uniform to Aberdeen Camp the next morning at 0800 hours. So the last hurdle was at hand. Tomorrow I would learn my fate, acceptance or rejection. I would not even contemplate being turned away. But if that happened, I'd face it in its own time. And tomorrow I would finally meet the commander of the unit, Colonel Charlie, not Charles, Beckwith. I knew almost nothing about the man. I'd never heard of him prior to my arrival at Selection, but most of the SF soldiers knew of him, and a few had served near, if not with him, in Vietnam and other locations around the world. The reports on Colonel Beckwith were a mixed lot. Some said he was a hell of a commander. Others said he was a megalomaniac with a reputation for getting his troops killed. But the reports made little difference to me. Commanders come and commanders go. If the unit has decent troops, it will survive. With a good commander, a good unit could prosper. With a bad one, a good unit could hold its own. And after what I'd seen during selection, the mere handful of men in the unit so far told me this was going to be one hell of an outfit. If Beckwith was crazy, I suspected it was a good kind of crazy. He was, and it was. But all that in good time. My board appearance was scheduled for 1,500 hours. We were severely cautioned against speaking to one another about anything that was said or done within the board. The morning and afternoon dragged by like geological epochs. I'm a patient man, but on this day, I could barely contain myself. I'd sit inside the waiting room for a while and then go outside to talk nervously with the other waiters. Men were called and would disappear inside. The first three men to be interviewed came out of the room ashen-faced and refused to look at us as they reported to the orderly room for orders to return to their home units. Rejected. Not accepted for assignment. Cold, hard, devastating words. My guts chilled and settled into a hard freeze as I watched those men, one by lonely one, 
walk away. Just like the dead and wounded seen stretched out after a firefight, they had my sympathy, but I was glad it wasn't me. I was also glad they left camp immediately and didn't say any awkward farewells. They were social lepers, and I didn't want to risk catching the infection they carried. I'm not proud of feeling that way, but I have to admit to the truth of those thoughts. Finally, two men in a row came out of that room so elated they looked like they would explode. You could tell they wanted to jump up and down or dance from the sheer pleasure of winning. Smiley led each of them away before they could say anything to those of us still waiting in limbo. Then, it was my turn. Okay, Eric, this is it. Compose yourself, keep your wits about you, and be ready for anything. Smiley told me to walk to the front of the room, halt in front of the chair, and report to the commander, just like any other board appearance. I gave my uniform a quick check, brought myself to the position of attention, picked up a thousand-yard stare, took a deep breath, and marched through the door and into the lion's den. Leave us go amongst them. I halted in front of the chair, with just enough space in front of me, so that when I turned about, I could sit straight down without having to look for the chair or back up to take my seat. I executed a parade ground about face, whipped up a quivering salute, waited two counts, and growled out in my best platoon sergeant voice, Sir, Sergeant Haney reports to the commander. It was my first view of Colonel Beckwith. I was looking at a point in space just above his head, but I could still see him clearly. A big man sprawled across the folding chair directly in front of me. His face was fierce, almost belligerent. It was the face he used for most occasions. He had a shock of slate-gray hair, a wide forehead, and piercing eyes set deep in his face, with dark circles underneath. His cheeks were high, but not prominent. His nose was hawk-like, but not large. His jawline looked like it had been shaped by an axe. His lower lip was pushed out slightly, creating an insolent air. His chest and shoulders were deep and wide, and his belly was expansive. All in all, he looked just like what he was, a warrior chieftain surrounded by his lieutenants. He let me hold my position while he looked me up and down several times before he finally returned my salute and told me to sit down. Then, the attack commenced. Haney... I understand you don't like officers, were the first words he hurled at me, dredged up from somewhere deep within his chest. I had told myself before this started that I would be brutally honest and not tap dance around any question. They were going to get Eric Haney, staff sergeant by the grace of God, in the raw and in person. I was going to give them the whole log, with the bark still on it, and to hell with the consequences. That's correct, sir. I fastened my eyes on his as I spoke. I despise most of the officers I've ever met. He came unglued. His face swelled and turned red, and the veins bulged out in his neck. But I was determined to take no shit. God damn it, Haney. That's mutinous, he shouted at me. What the hell's wrong with you? How could you make a statement like that? Sir... Most of the officers I've met spend the majority of their time scheming for career progression and looking for ways to stab each other in the back. The only good thing about that is they usually leave the NCOs and the soldiers alone to get on with unit business, at least until they want to put on some kind of dog and pony show to impress someone with how great they are. From the corner of my eye, I could see Sergeant Major Country Grimes trying to suppress a grin. Ah... Just maybe I have one ally in the room. Beckwith ranted and raved until eventually his anger lost steam. He looked at me like I was a biological specimen. Then he leaned back in his chair, swelled out his chest, and asked in an arrogant voice, Well, Sergeant Smartass, what did you think of stress phase? Sir, I kept waiting for the stress to start. You what? He leapt from his chair, spraying spittle through the air. You kept waiting for stress to start? What in God's name do you mean by that? Are you out of your mind? His face was so swollen with rage, I thought he might have a stroke. He stood there gasping for air and gaping at me. 
Sir, I ate four meals a day and slept at least eight hours every night. No one was shooting at me. I never stepped on a landmine. The weather was good. I never got frostbite or had heat exhaustion. I was responsible for myself and no one else. Yep, it was hard. In some ways, the hardest thing I've ever done. But sir, there are more difficult things in life than selection. He huffed and puffed about that until he thought up something else to slap me with. And that was the way it went. We took turns yelling at one another. He would tell me the rangers were a bunch of pansies, and I'd tell him he was full of mud. He told me I was just a parade ground soldier, and I countered that he obviously hadn't read my record because I'd never served a day in anything but combat units. Beckwith would rant until he literally ran out of breath and then someone else in the room would come at me with something else. I was getting it from all sides, like a bear with its back to a cliff and a pack of hounds lunging in and snapping at its flanks. It got so intense, I thought I was going to have to fight. At one point, Beckwith said he'd had enough of my shit and was just going to have Sergeant Russell here kick my ass, indicating a big, hard-looking man seated in the front row. I stared at Russell turned back to look the colonel straight in the face and told him that that was one order he'd better not give unless he wanted to see me thrash his man. Russell held my gaze and smiled slightly, and I got my feet under me, ready to jump if I had to. If Beckwith ordered Russell at me, I planned to kick him in the face and take him out of the fight before he could get out of his chair. I'd only get the one chance. We took a breather then, it was like the bell had rung and the colonel and I fell back in our chairs, panting like two boxers between rounds. I'd been taking some big punches, but felt like I had thrown a few good ones of my own. Then Sergeant Major Grimes broke the heavy quiet. Haney, he said in his Pennsylvania mountain twang, the peer reports of the other men indicated they don't think very highly of you. Said they thought you were a pretty poor example of a soldier. His voice was calm and measured, and he watched me intently, one eye squinted like he was inspecting a rifle barrel. I thought for a few seconds about what he said. Then I answered, Sergeant Major, that's bullshit and you know it. You're just trying to rattle my cage. I'm the best goddamn soldier those men have ever met in their military lives. Grimes stifled another grin. Someone on the other side of the room, someone who just had to be an officer, wagged his finger at me and accused me of being evasive and mealy-mouthed, said I'd refuse to answer all the questions in my psychological battery. I asked him what he was talking about, and he held up a sheet of paper and read aloud, I love my mother, but... Why didn't you complete the sentence? He yelled at me, shaking the rolled sheet of paper in the air. There's nothing to complete, I said. I love my mother, no buts about it. Don't try to put your feelings about your own mother off on me. Colonel, I've had enough, he said, turning to look at Colonel Beckwith. This man can't give a straight answer to the simplest question. He's been nothing but insolent and disrespectful since he walked in the door. I, for one, have seen and heard enough. The colonel nodded his agreement. Looking back at me, he said, Get out and wait till I call for you. He dismissed me with a jerk of his thumb toward the door. I stood, saluted, and started for the door. He waved what could only vaguely be called a salute in my general direction as I marched for the door and exercised the utmost of my self-control to keep from slamming it behind me. I stalked to the far end of the hall and paced back and forth in a four-foot square. I was wound up tighter than a two-dollar watch. One of my selection mates, Jimmy Johnson, could stand it no longer and came down to talk to me. I cut him off with a raised hand before he opened his mouth and drew breath. Jimmy, don't ask me a damned thing. You know I can't say anything, and you'll put us both in a trick if you don't just go away. Now leave me alone. With that, I turned my back on him and paced in the other direction. The men at the other end of the hall stared at me like I had anthrax. A few minutes later, Smiley came out of the conference room and beckoned me to come with him into another room. It was the medical station. Read the chart on the wall, he said. All lines, top to bottom. With my glasses or without? With. I read them and then asked, what the hell is this all about? 
The colonel wants to know how well you can see. Very few men who wear glasses have made it through stress phase. Now come with me. He wants you back inside. Just take your seat. You don't have to report again. I went back to my chair and stared at Colonel Beckwith. He looked at Smiley and asked, Well? Smiley nodded. Colonel, his vision is fine with his glasses. The colonel turned his eyes to me. His gaze was still fierce, but the belligerence was gone. Well, Haney, he said, with just the slightest lilt of humor in his voice, you've got a little bit of a temper on you once you get roused, don't you? Yes, sir, I'm afraid I do. And you've got a smart mouth to go along with it, don't you? Yes, sir, I have one of those, too. And you're kind of prone to shooting from the hip, sort of rapid fire-like, when somebody pokes at you, aren't you? Yes, sir, I'd say that's also true. He pushed out his lower lip and paused in reflection for a few seconds before continuing, Well, hell, son, so am I. And it ain't necessarily bad all the time. The trick is knowing when it'll work and when it won't. But I like your style, and I want you with us. He stood as he said the last sentence and extended a bare paw of a hand in my direction. I looked at his hand, looked at his face, and smiled. I grabbed his still outstretched hand, gave it a good shake, and felt the power of his grip. The other men in the room crowded round and offered their congratulations. Welcome aboard, they said. Good to have you with us. Grimes grinned at me. Just rattling your cage, eh? Yes, Sergeant Major. That's what you were doing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And I thought I'd gotten to you for a second there. You came mighty close, Sergeant Major. You damn sure did. And that was it. I had made it. I was a member of the newest, most elite unit in the National Inventory. When the board completed its business, there were 12 new members of 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, Delta. Of the original 163 men who started selection, 18 had passed stress phase and 12 had survived the commander's board. Four men had been rejected outright and two others were told they could try again at a future date. Both did, and both were eventually selected. The success rate for this selection course was slightly above 7%. It would turn out to be the highest in Delta Force history. I returned to Hunter Field to outprocess and move my family to Fort Bragg. Jim Bush and I were the first men from the Ranger Battalion to make it into that mysterious new unit. And the fact that we couldn't say anything about it just added to our celebrity. I packed up, said my farewells, and headed out for a new phase of life. I had no idea what I was in for. When I look back at the young man I was then, I can only shake my head in wonder at the good fortune he carried with him to that new assignment. Life would be difficult most of the time, and dangerous almost all the time. And every once in a while, it would be deadly. And that was uh, the end of In the Beginning from Inside Delta Force by Eric L. Haney, Command Sergeant Major, retired. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States. Today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you to be honest, smart, and beautiful and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.